In part 2 of this video, we will be looking at management of diabetic ketoacidosis. DKA was a disorder with more than 95% mortality in pre-insulin era. With the discovery of insulin by Banting and Best in 1921, a major reduction in mortality occurred. In earlier days, we used high dose insulin ranging from 5 to 6 units per kg per day. Later, with newer techniques and fluids, the combination of insulin with adequate hydration brought down the mortality to 10%. The use of low dose insulin and refined fluid therapy brought down the mortality further to 3 to 5%. Several protocol-based managements with establishment of new guidelines have significantly reduced the mortality of DKA to less than 1% in developed nations. There are five essential goals while treating a child with DKA. Assess and properly correct dehydration. Arrest ketogenesis with insulin therapy. Anticipate and replace ongoing fluid and electrolyte losses. Assess and treat Precipitating cause. Anticipate and intervene rapidly if any complication occur. The most important component of therapy is the fluid therapy. The first step is to assess the degree of dehydration. The clinical signs of dehydration are not prominent in DKA. The intravascular volume is well preserved and shock is rare. So how to decide on volume needed to correct dehydration? whether it is 5% or 10% or 15%. A study by Coase has suggested that there was no agreement between clinician assessed dehydration and the measured dehydration. Intravascular volume is preserved in DKA which leads to absence of conventional signs of dehydration. A gross underestimation of dehydration is usually done by the clinicians while estimating dehydration. Usual range of deficit varies from 5 to 10 percentage. In mild to moderate cases, it may vary from 5 to 7 and in severe cases from 7 to 10 percent. So DKA is one condition where one size fits all approach is used. We usually follow a deficit range of 6.5 to 8.5 percent while correcting for DKA. During the first hour, if the child is in hypotensive shock, we give a 20 ml per kg bolus of normal saline. Repeat bolus may be needed based on hemodynamic parameters. In others who are volume depleted but not in shock, a 10 ml per kg bolus of saline is given over 60 minutes. Beyond the first hour, the maintenance fluids obtained from holiday cigar equation is added to deficit which is usually assumed as 65 to 85 ml per kg by this calculation, the usual volume needed is 1.5 to 2 times the maintenance. It is always better to correct these children slowly over a period of 36 to 48 hours. This avoids the risk of rapid osmolar shift and thereby reduces the risk of cerebral edema. Saline has remained the standard fluid in all these children. Small studies which have compared balanced fluid with 0.9% saline are found to be equally efficacious. However, larger studies are needed before using balanced fluids into practice. As we start fluids and insulin, the plasma glucose level tends to drop. Start replacement fluids containing 5% dextrose once the plasma glucose reaches below 200 mg per deciliter. The dextrose may need to be hiked if there is further fall in glucose despite supplementation. It is important to remember that insulin administration need to be considered until ketonemia resolves completely and the dose should not be reduced at this point. Half DNS is the preferred fluid in conditions where the sodium is also getting corrected as expected. Many centers have started using the two bag system while managing DK. In this, bags containing isotonic fluids with equal amounts of potassium are used. One bag contains 10% dextrose whereas the other bag does not contain any dextrose. The bag without dextrose is used as resuscitation fluid. Dextrose infusion is added when the glucose drops to 250 mg per deciliter. By adjusting the rate of infusion of individual bags, 
the sodium concentration and the dextrose concentration can be adjusted. The next important step in DK management is insulin administration. This is a key step to arrest ketogenesis. Remember, there is no role of bolus insulin. Insulin has to be started after one hour of fluid therapy. Study by Edge and colleagues showed that in the initial hours of resuscitation, the increasing dose of insulin, there was increasing risk of cerebral edema. There are also studies comparing lower dose of insulin with the standard dose of insulin in pediatric diabetic ketoacidosis. This study found that the mean blood glucose decrease until the levels are less than 250 mg per deciliter was similar in both the groups. They also observed a similar duration of resolution of acidosis and a smoother fall in blood glucose with lower incidence of hypoglycemia in the low dose insulin group. In the developing world, while malnutrition is very common, these children have poor potassium stores and are also prone to develop hypoglycemia. At the same time, there is also a high risk of developing cerebral edema in these children due to delayed presentation and severe acidosis. So in such a setting, a starting at a lower dose as 0 0.05 unit per kg per hour is probably safer. There are certain precautions which we need to take while administering insulin. It has to be a fresh insulin with appropriate dilution in a separate venous axis and the entire line has to be flushed adequately. Insulin has the tendency to adhere to tubings, hence this step is of utmost importance. The desired rate of fall of blood glucose is 50 to 100 mg per deciliter per hour. If this fall does not occur, we need to confirm the patency of IV cannula, the insulin preparation and expiry date, the appropriate dose of dilution before deciding on hiking the dose of insulin. The third important component in managing DKA is to manage electrolyte imbalance. Hypokalemia is quite common in children with DKA and this worsens following insulin therapy as insulin causes transcellular shift of potassium leading on to hypokalemia. Western literature report an incidence of 4 to 10 percent. This is quite high in Indian population. Target potassium range is usually 4 to 5 milliequivalents per liter. If the potassium is less than 3.5, they require immediate potassium correction and insulin can be administered after a delay. If the range is between 3.5 to 5, potassium maintenance is added at 40 millimole per liter after ensuring adequate urine output. In rare scenarios where potassium is more than 5, potassium administration can be delayed until the potassium levels are less than 5. Hypophosphatemia is another common abnormality in these children. Routine supplementation of phosphate is not recommended unless the child has cardiac dysfunction, respiratory depression, muscle weakness during recovery or in a serum phosphate which is lower than 1 mg per deciliter. Potassium phosphate and potassium acetate are commonly used as phosphate supplements. Bicarbonate is not routinely recommended in treating diabetic ketoacidosis. The exception to this is a severe acidosis with myocardial dysfunction or life-threatening hyperkalemia where a single dose of bicarbonate may be used. Let us try to understand these principles through this case example. Let us assume that a 10 kg child is brought to us with moderate decay. At admission at 0 hours, we find that if the child is hypotensive, we start him on a bolus of 20 ml per kg. If not, we start him on a bolus of 10 ml per kg given over a period of 1 hour. At the end of 1 hour, we reassess his status and start him on insulin at 0 0.05 unit per kg. Simultaneously, the maintenance fluids are also initiated. For this 10 kg child, the maintenance fluid for a total duration of 48 hours turns out to be 2000 ml. Along with this, the deficit is also added. We usually take a deficit of 70 ml per kg for moderate dehydration. By this calculation, it turns out to be 55 ml per hour. At 40 millimole per liter is added to this fluid. We continue to monitor this child for decrease in glucose and closing of anion gap with maintenance of osmolality. Let us assume that at 6 hours of hospital stay, 
the blood glucose level drops below 250. Here, the IV fluids have to be changed and dextrose has to be added to the IV fluid. We continue to monitor these children for resolution of decay. Majority of cases resolve within 24 hours of hospitalization. Once the endpoints of decay are achieved, we switch over to subcutaneous insulin and, and start them on a diabetic regimen. Diabetic ketoacidosis requires stringent monitoring in an intensive care setting. The vital have to be taken hourly. Neurological status, especially pupil and GCS, have to be meticulously documented every two hours. This ch these children require continuous ECG monitoring. Blood glucose should be done hourly. Blood gases and serum electrolytes should be repeated four hourly. Beta hydroxybutyrate, if available, has to be done four hourly. In a child who is recovering from diabetic ketoacidosis, we expect the blood glucose to drop by 50 to 100 mg per deciliter per hour. The pH should start to increase by 0 0.03 per hour. The anion gap should start to close. The serum sodium should increase by 1.6 millimole per liter for every 100 mg per deciliter falling blood glucose. There should be least variability in corrected sodium and the rate of fall of serum osmolality should be gradual. A resolution of DK is defined as blood glucose concentration of less than 200, a bicarbonate level of more than 15, venous pH of more than 7.3, a closed anion gap less than 14 and a serum beta hydroxy brute rate less than 1 millimole per liter. We can switch to subcutaneous insulin if the endpoints are achieved and the child is awake and alert and is able to tolerate the oral feeds well without any nausea or vomiting. We start him on subcutaneous insulin at least 30 minutes before stopping intravenous insulin. To summarize, a child who presents to us with hyperglycemia, ketosis and acidosis, once the diagnosis of DK is confirmed, we initiate him on fluids. The usual fluid of choice is saline. We estimate a deficit of 6.5 to 10% and add it to maintenance fluid and give it over a duration of 48 hours. Potassium has to be added at 40 millimole per liter after ensuring adequate urine output to maintain the potassium between 3.5 to 5 milliequivalent per liter. Start insulin therapy at 0.05 to 0.1 unit per kg per hour. Once the blood glucose drops below 250 mg per deciliter, change the fluid to dextrose containing fluids. Target blood glucose around the range of 200 to 250 by titrating dextrose concentration. Once the endpoints of DK are achieved and the child is able to tolerate the feeds, switch him to subcutaneous insulin and put him on a diabetic plan. If you like these videos, please subscribe us at Little Criticos. You can also follow us at these platforms for weekly updates.